sermon again. <laughs> Some years ago, I attended a Sunday service at a friend's church in Fitchburg at his invitation. And when I walked in, I was met by a well-dressed young man who looked quite official. And I assumed that he would welcome me and guide me to the sanctuary and um, show me where I might sit or direct me to my friend. And he did welcome me. And then he took my arm and gently led me into a coat room where he said, we require ties for gentlemen in this church and dresses for ladies. Here are a few ties. Pick one that you like and you can put it on in the men's room across the hall. So I did and then I went into the sanctuary and found my friend and he too was wearing a tie as was every single man in the place as I looked around wearing a tie. And they all looked really nice, by the way. Now I have to tell you, that's not the kind of church that I would attend very often. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is I despise ties. I have this situation and I've had it my whole life. My neck is two sizes larger than my shirt size. So if I wear a shirt that fits me, I can't get the buttons even close to buttoning up here for a tie. And if I wear a shirt with a, tie, with a neck that fits me, I'm swimming in it. So I hate ties. And I rarely wear them, although sometimes I do, when it's necessary for the occasion. But the other reason that I wouldn't go often to a church like that is that I don't think Jesus cares what we wear when we come to church, as long as we're decent, you know, everything's covered, and, you know, we're not offensive in our bodily habits or whatnot for the other people. I don't think Jesus cares about that. When he called his disciples, I don't recall anywhere in the Bible that it says, now you have to visit a barber. Or now we'll go to the tailor and get you all new wardrobes. He accepted them just as they were. Now my grandchildren will tell you that I don't actually have a neck to wear a tie, that my head sits directly on my shoulders. And there may be some truth to that because there really isn't a lot there. As we continue our Greatest Hymns sermon series today, we're going to look at a wonderful and very meaningful hymn that was written in 1834 by a British woman who lived much of her life as an invalid and who for some years feared that her infirmities made her unacceptable to Jesus. The hymn, Just As I Am by Charlotte Elliott, is a celebration of Christ's promise of love and acceptance of anyone and his promise to bring salvation to all who believe in him. So we'll start this morning by reading the words of the hymn. We just sang them, but we'll read them quickly. And you'll notice there's a seventh verse. We only sang six. Most contemporary hymnals don't do all seven. Um, it does get a little long, but we'll read all seven of the original verses. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears within and without, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am, poor, wretched, blind, sight, riches, healing of the mind, yea, all I need in thee to find, O Lamb of God, I come. 
just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. Because thy promise, I believe, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am, thy love unknown has broken every, every barrier down, now to be thine, yea, thine alone, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am of that free love, the breadth, length, depth, and height, to prove here for a season, then above, O Lamb of God, I come. I've always found this to be a very, very inspiring hymn because it speaks to the universality of, of Christ's love. He's everybody's savior. He's not just a savior to a few. He's a savior to the many. Anyone who chooses to believe in him. There is no one who cannot receive his grace if they confess and seek forgiveness and believe in him. This, unfortunately, though, is a hard thing for many people to believe. I have met a number of people over the years who have said to me, Christ wouldn't want me. I've done too many bad things. And that's sad. Because anyone who has been saved after being in that same kind of life, knows that Christ's love is so powerful and so available because Jesus wants everyone. Charlotte Elliott was one of those who said for many years, Christ wouldn't want me. She was born in 1789 and grew up in a Christian home. Her grandfather and two brothers were ministers. And her father was a businessman, but was devout. Charlotte was apparently never particularly healthy, either physically or emotionally, suffering from both physical ailments and what we today know as depression uh, and probably anxiety. By her early adulthood, she had become a fairly well-known portrait artist and a writer of humorous verse. And she had turned away from her Christian heritage to hang out in social circles that were not exactly models of Christian morality. Then at the age of 32, she became very, very ill. And from then spent most of her life bedridden, forcing her to drop out of those fancy social circles. With her illness, she became despondent and fearful about her eternal future. And it happened that during this time when she was so ill and in bed, and she was at her parents' home, that the famous and renowned theologian and writer Cesar Milan of Geneva was visiting her family. And he spent some time with her and encouraged her to give her life to Jesus. He told her Christ would accept her just as she was. She didn't need to change. Now, at first, she resisted, but a few days later, she called him in to her um, sick room, I guess we'd call it, and asked him again to explain to her what he had explained before. And when he did, she gave her life to Jesus. It was this assurance that Jesus accepts us as we are that led her 12 years later to write Just As I Am. It was an interesting situation. She still struggled with, with emotional problems, depression and, and anxiety. And her brother, one of her brothers, had started a school for the daughters of clergy. And he was holding a bazaar and all the family was abuzz and involved and doing all kinds of things for this bazaar to raise money for the school. And Charlotte was in her bed. And she became despondent because she wasn't able to help in any way because of her health. One of her bi biographers wrote, The night before the bazaar, she was kept wakeful by distressing thoughts of her 
apparent uselessness. And these thoughts passed by a transition, easy to imagine, into a spiritual conflict until she questioned the reality of her whole spiritual life and wondered whether it was anything better after all than an illusion of the emotions. The next day, she took up pen and paper with the intention of reassuring herself of Christ's promise and quickly wrote the words of this hymn, Just As I Am. And Just As I Am became the most successful of the 150 or so hymns that she wrote over the rest of her life. And she gave much of the proceeds from that hymn to her brother's school. And thus, she helped out more than anyone else in her family in keeping that school running. A short time after the song was written, she became editor of a number of Christian publications, including what was called the Invalid's Hymn Book. And this was an annual booklet that included the uh, annual publication that included the songs of people who were invalids or about invalids. I know that's not a, probably not a politically correct term to use today, but it nevertheless was the title, the name of the hymn book. And over time, she had 115 of her own poems and hymns in that hymn book, bringing joy and inspiration to hundreds, thousands of people. She died in 1871 at the ripe old age of 82. Christian writer Loretta Rouster called her songs an amazing legacy for an invalid woman who suffered from depression and felt useless to God's service useless to God's service. Now, I've known many Christians, perhaps some of you, who feel that their shortcomings make them unworthy of the love of Jesus Christ. Unworthy to come to Jesus and give themselves to him, to be with him eternally in heaven. Perhaps you have doubts as Charlotte Elliott did, that you're just not good enough, not faithful enough, not pure or holy enough. I know these feelings are especially prevalent in people who grew up in families where their parents were constantly critical of them, whose parents they never seemed to be able to please. But that's not our God. Look at what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 29. He said, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. God does not turn us away because of our frailties and our failures. Indeed, if he required those he called to be perfect and pure, None of us could go. Who would be able to answer? Not one of us would be able to answer. Jesus bids us to come. Elizabeth, Charlotte Elliot rather, wrote in her stanza two of her hymn. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot. If we wait to rid our own souls of the many dark blots that are there, We'll be waiting forever because only Jesus can cleanse us of our sins. Only he has that power. 
And he will do so only when we accept him and believe in him. As Paul says in this passage, those who are so caught up in their own wisdom, with their own strength, that they can't see a need for Jesus, will never, unless they become broken, seek him in their lives. And thanks be to God, many, many become broken. Just as Charlotte Elliott was broken. Just as I was broken. Just as all of you were broken at some point or another in your life and brought low by physical, in Charlotte Elliott's case, physical and emotional frailties. The stanza makes me think of the rich man who asked Jesus what he must do to inherit heaven, eternal life. Mark 10, 19 to 22 says, Jesus answered, you know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. I just love that Jesus looked at this man and loved him. He didn't look at this man and scorn him. He didn't have any ill will toward him. He loved him. He accepted him just as he was. But Jesus knew that the man would never give himself over to Jesus because of his passions for the things of this world. He wouldn't give them up. So Jesus challenged the man in the only way that he could to do the one thing, the one thing that would break him away from those early pa uh, earthly passions. Give them up. Give them away. But rather than taking the challenge, the selfish man walked away. He walked away from salvation. At this, the man's face fell, it says. He went away sad because he had great wealth. It is so sad when someone does that, when someone chooses the things of the world rather than the things of eternity. So sad. And yet, so many do. My favorite verse in this hymn is the fifth. Just as I am, though thou wilt receive, will welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. Because thy promise I believe, O Lamb of God, I come. No matter how we come to him, Jesus will receive us because we are answering the call of God that was proclaimed in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only beloved son, one and only son. I get mixed up between the King James and the, and the NIV. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. So not only will he receive us, but he will welcome us. Welcome us. I have this picture. It's not on our wall in our new house yet but it will be sometime, of Jesus wrapping his arms around a man up in a heavenly place. And I see that. That's what Jesus does to each of us. He wraps his hands. It reminds me of Larry. Larry who walks up and just wraps his arms around you every time he sees you. That's what Jesus does. He'll not only receive us, but he'll welcome us. As it says in John 6, 37, all those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. He will welcome us as his brothers and sisters, children of God and co-heirs of the kingdom. We're co-heirs of the kingdom of God, the Bible tells us. Paul says in Romans 8, 16 to 17, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. 
Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. He will also pardon us, it says in the hymn. Pardon us for our past sins and then cleanse us. Cleanse us not only of those past sins, but continue to cleanse us of each sin that we commit, continue to commit on this earthly place that we live. I have a friend who, who does Christian counseling and mostly with children, and she teaches them about how Jesus loves them so desperately and wants them to be with him and, and how he will cleanse them. And she uses the image of Jesus walking around with a garden hose behind them as they walk through their life and every time they get into themselves in a muddy, dirty place, he's washing them down with that garden hose, cleansing them of their sins. He will pardon us, he will cleanse us until we receive the gift of holiness. And that comes at the end of our earthly lives. John tells us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Finally, Charlotte tells us, he relieves us. He relieves us forever of all pain and fear and suffering and sadness as we share his inheritance in heaven. John says in Revelation 21, 4, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. The song, Just As I Am, has had a tremendous impact on the world. It has been published in hundreds of hymn books. It has been translated into dozens and dozens of languages. It's sung in churches around the world. It's been used by the greatest evangelists from Dwight L. Moody to Billy Graham. In fact, during his 58 years of conducting evangelistic campaigns that he called crusades, Billy Graham always had this hymn sung during his altar call, coming people, calling people to come forward and accept Jesus Christ. And millions did as this song played. Millions of people came forward to accept Jesus. And Graham then titled his autobiography, Just As I Am. And he said the, the song had the strongest possible biblical basis for the call of Christ. All of this came from a woman who feared that because of her physical and emotional infirmities that she was useless, useless, to Christ and unacceptable to him. And yet, she accepted Christ's invitation and he used her in a mighty, mighty way. And she learned that his invitation is for everyone, not just the strong, not just the confident, not just the healthy, certainly not just the pure, because none of us are pure. Christ calls us to come to him. How? Just as we are. And then he starts the changes. The Holy Spirit comes into us and starts the changing. And that changing continues until the very day that we die and finally attain purity because of his love and his devotion to us, not because of anything that we have done. Christ calls us to come to him just as we are. This morning, I would like to invite anyone who has not yet come to Christ to do so. 
I invite you to do this with, with me reading the prayer that will be on the screen. And if you do so, and you mean it from your heart, then you will be saved in Jesus Christ. So read with me if you would like. Dear Lord, I confess that I am a sinner and have lived my life for myself only. I am sorry and ask you to forgive me. I believe that you died on the cross to save me. I come to you now and ask you to come into my heart and take control of my life. Help me to live every day for you. I love you, Lord, and thank you that I will spend all eternity with you. Amen. If you've prayed this prayer and meant it, you are saved in Jesus. If you would like to talk about this, and if you're at home, you can call me at 413-349-8444. That's 413-349-8444. Or email me your phone number at shootsburychurch at gmail.com, and I will call you. And if you're here, just see me after the service, and we can talk. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful. We are so grateful that you have saved Charlotte Elliott, that you gave her such inspiration, that you have made her a mighty worker for the Lord, despite her infirmities. And Lord, we pray that you'll do that for each one of us. We want to be mighty workers for the Lord. And so, pray, Lord, we pray that you will give us the opportunity, that you will give us the will, that you will give us the way, and that you will give us the strength and the means so that we can serve you in a mighty way and bring you to many to your work here on this earth. And we pray this in Jesus' name, who is and always will be our Savior. Amen. This is Communion Sunday. And so we will take our communion cups in our little wafers. We hopefully will be changing back eventually to passing them out during the service. Um, but with the, the Delta variant raising its ugly head, I think we'll delay that a little. <clears throat> Jesus said, I am the bread of life. All who come to me shall not hunger, and all who believe in me shall not thirst. We gather this morning with Christians around the world with the bread and the wine, symbols of nourishment and transformation in Jesus Christ. All who believe in him as Lord are invited to partake in our communion this morning. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that you would still our minds and quiet our hearts as we come to the communion table this morning. Draw us into ever, ever closer fellowship with you as we partake of the bread and the wine in grateful remembrance of what you did for us on Calvary's cross. We pray that you will bless this bread and this cup through this meal and make us the body of Christ. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me, ministering to you. In Christ's name, I offer you this bread. Take it and eat it, remembering that Christ is the bread of life. same way he took the cup and he gave it to them saying drink of it all of you 
For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Ministering to you in Christ's name, I offer you this cup. Take it and drink it, remembering that Christ is the cup of salvation. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you willingly offered your body as a sacrifice for our sins. That you allowed your body to be broken for us and your precious blood to be shed to pay the full price for our sins. Lord, we pray that you will strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and help us to be more devoted in our love and service to you. Amen.